I'm absolutely delighted to have Rebecca Curo with us. Rebecca, a very good morning. Yes, it's still good morning where you are in New Zealand. Good morning, Rebecca. How are you? I'm all good, Tom, apart from a small cold, but then we can blame the South Island of New Zealand for giving that to me. Well, Rebecca's just, uh, I think, competed in the National Veterans Rowing Championships in a little freezing cold place called Twizel in the deep south of the South Island. And um, how many races did you do over the weekend, Rebecca? I did uh, 13 or 14. Oh, this is better. I think, I think your, your cold is thoroughly deserved, and you're waking up at probably 4 degrees or minus 2 degrees or something, you're rowing on a lake. But, uh, but outstanding, inspirational stuff. But uh, we're not going to talk about rowing this morning, folks. Um, let, me, let, me give, let me give you Rebecca's bio, but then I want to tell you why she's really here, okay? Rebecca is a disruptive marketer. She's also the CEO of, I love that, disruptive marketer, CEO of Creative Agency Secrets, an execution marketing agency. She's going to talk to us today about exactly what's on the screen, how to create demand for your business by learning how to make your website perform. It's so much wasted real estate for so many people. Okay. So her clients need strong marketing delivered every month with persistence and diligence. Who doesn't? And so she shows people, walks and tracks, and very often will do it for them, shows clients, website visitors, generates leads, incoming inquiries. And she has a very specific eight-step new business development process and, and backed by solid marketing execution. She works with clients in two ways. First of all, she teaches them how to do the marketing themselves, or she does the marketing for them, which sign me up for that one. Both, both of them build consistently improved marketing metrics from month to month, and that's the other key differentiator with, with, with Rebecca, I believe, is she actually measures the results, so you know you're getting results. Now, so she understands running an SME, and she understands how to run a marketing program very economically, because she's done both of those things herself for many years, for both her own business and a client. She's, um, her business has a social entrepreneurship component, so the firm takes on marketing interns, it trains them, gives them the best full-time job, uh, enables her to offer low-cost marketing services via trainees to clients while still maintaining high quality and effectiveness uh, and, and developing bright minds for the future. Now, the, the reason, that's all very cool and very true and very worthwhile, the reason that I've invited Rebecca here is that I still can't remember how but I got onto Rebecca's website. I think I Googled something like best website marketing examples or something like that. Went across her and I thought, wow, this is pretty special. And then they had, she had a client website section. So you could go through you know, the tab and go, okay, well, this is what she's done for clients. And I clicked on one that really stood out. And it was a poor gentleman by the name of Bruce Ross. Now, Bruce and I used to work together. When I launched the Entrepreneur Success Program, my ESP program, uh, Bruce was, was working with me to help market that. So, he and I know each other really, really well. He's a little bit older, a little bit grayer, but I thought, I know that face. It was Bruce. And it was one of the most spectacularly uh, focused websites that I've seen where the value proposition was clear. And for those of you who have attended my own webinars, you know I'm very keen on getting the marketing message right. And, and so I think, God, Rebecca, the creative agencies, they did this website. And I looked at the other websites, and they all had a constant theme. But the constant theme was this, very clear benefit-rich value proposition and a very clear call to action. Not 101 different things you can do, but if you dig, if you like this value proposition, here's what you do. So I got a hold of Rebecca, she didn't know me from Bar Soap, and I said, oh, and then she ordered, she was kind enough to order 10 copies of my book, which also helped a bit, I guess. <laughs> In fact, I emailed her and said, are you sure you meant to order 10? Because most people only order one. She said, yeah, I want to order 10, I want to give them to my client. So that was another, I think, a mark of character that she, she gives to her client. Okay. So I said to her, look, I would really like to interview you on how you do websites because, uh, you know, I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's the first time I had consciously discovered a website that ticked all the marketing principles that I felt. So we did, we did a short webinar, we called it the BOM interview, the Business Owners Marketing Brief, and then I said to Rebecca, do you do webinars as well? Could, would you do a webinar for my network? She fortunately said yes. So Rebecca, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Take it away. Great intro, Tom, and thank you so very much. It's lovely to meet all you guys, and thank you for trusting Tom for introducing me, and I'm guaranteeing that I'm going to be giving you awesome value today. By the time we finish, you're going to have a five really, really good understanding of things you can do today 
to check out whether your website is delivering what you want. And these are tools that anyone can use. I want to be really clear, you do not need to be an IT genius, a geek. Uh, if you are, you and I can be best friends because I love that sort of stuff. But this is about normal people with a normal functioning understanding of using IT, not making it. Can I also ask that you ask questions as we go along? It's really great because the chances are, if you're thinking a question, there'll be someone else out there who's probably also thinking it. So it's really helpful if you ask them when they come to mind. Right, let's kick off. One of the first things about having a business website is that unlike learning to drive a car, where you have to do a driving test in order to be legal to drive, any old fool can set up a website. One of the problems is that most of us do not know how to drive a website. Now when we design websites, you probably all know this, there are two bits. There's the design, which is the front end pretty picture, and then there's the functionality, which is the back end. And at the bottom of this slide, I've shown you a, a client of mine, Catherine Stewart, she's Employment Lawyer of the Year. Beautiful picture, lovely website. And then on the right, the black panel on the left-hand side is the uh, menu, and then there's a dashboard and all sorts of things that we can do um, which will manage her website for her. Now, these two things are the very first reason why your website's not performing, and there are going to be five reasons that I'm going to give you. Please grab that pen and paper and start writing them down. Now, the number one reason your website is not performing as you hoped is a misalignment between the design of the front end and the functionality of the back end. Both of these are important. Both of these need to work together. And I'm going to illustrate it with a example from a client. The client has been rebranded by a great, strong, innovative graphic design agency. And they sent my client this, which was a picture of their new suggested layout of their homepage. What I did was put that image through a little tester program to find out how much of it is above the fold. Now, above the fold is a technical phrase we use to describe what bit of your website displays when somebody first types it in and hits enter. And depending on the size of the screen you're using, the amount that displays is different. So look closely at those little horizontal red lines. The first one on the left says 1920px. So that's 1920 pixel screens below. There's another red line for 1280. And then there's another one for 1024. What that tells me is that if you happen to be viewing this website, if we had built it, you can probably we guess that we did not build it this way. If you've got a 1920px screen, you will not see any of the principal marketing message, which would be the green text below the photograph. Well, that's shit. Excuse my French. It basically means I'm making the customer work before I've even got close to finding out whether she wants to work with us or we want to work with her. We're making them work to find our marketing message. We're showing a pretty picture with two little bubbles, um, a logo and a menu. No good. Absolutely no good at all. Now, that's one of the challenges of using people who are not used to designing for the web to do your design. Nothing wrong with these designers. Let me be completely clear. They're very, very skillful. But this just demonstrated to me that they did not understand this principle number one the back end and the front end of your website must work together. It's not the same as doing a print brochure. Now, website marketing actually works in two ways. It's a, a bit like a highway in that respect. The first way is, what do I want to get found for? And the second is what you are actually getting found for. And you can see here, there's an obvious opportunity for disconnect. So one of the uh, top three frustrations that we promised we'd share with you that 
business owners like yourself tell me they have with their websites. And this is what they say. I've got visitors to my website, but I've got no inquiries or no leads. Secondly, they might say, I've got no visitors to my website. That's a rather diff different and perhaps slightly more challenging obstacle. The third thing they say is, I've got inquiries, but they're spammy or they're low quality or they're not my ideal customer. Your website marketing is the thing that will help you get over those three frustrations. And I'm going to tell you, I think the number one reason, the top five reasons why your website isn't working and why you get those frustrating outcomes is because your website is not designed to work the way that your prospective clients need it to work. So I'm a marketer. If your marketing works, you do not have to do any selling because someone comes to you, makes an inquiry, and they're ready or nearly ready to buy. They're asking the right questions already. And large numbers of professionals will tell me over and over, I really do not like selling. Selling isn't really a dirty word, but I genuinely would prefer not to have to do any of it. On the other hand, if someone comes to my website and makes an inquiry, I'm very happy to answer their questions because I absolutely know that I can answer the questions later on. I can get them talking, and then once we're talking, then we'll establish whether or not we're right for each other. So let's go on to find out which of these things are going to be working for you and which are working against you. Take a look at this slide. What you've got here is two identical bits of Google Analytics, which uh, track the queries that people type into Google that made a visitor ultimately come through and click on my client's websites. These are two different websites. I'm going to do a, a quick poll. So uh, on the right side of your screen, there's the opportunity to ask a question. So if you'd like to hit the little gray arrow next to where it says questions, expand that. And I'd like you to tell me, with the left or the right, what you think the website is for what they are selling. So first, let's uh, get some answers for the one on the left. What do you think, based on the questions that have been asked, that this website is selling? So the questions uh, people are writing into Google are things like electronic signatures, about time, business sites, cattle sorting sticks, a CD grip, and so on. Tom, what are we getting on the questions? What do people think it's about? Tom, are you able to hear me? Because I'm not seeing any of these questions. Radio. So, the one on the left is actually a business that provides time management advice. And the one on the right is a business that sells sports equipment. Now, you can probably guess that the one on the right is looking pretty healthy as far as 
the sorts of questions about rowing and rowing shoes and uh, rowing apps are very aligned to what that business is actually delivering. But the one on the left is very misaligned with what that business actually sells. So this is your number two reason of why your website may be underperforming. The first is your keywords not showing up in natural search for the sort of questions that you want to show up for. These two have got to line up in order to make it work. Now, your website works in two directions, as I explained earlier. And what I'm going to show you now is a little tool which is a um, extension in the Chrome or Firefox browser. It's designed by an outfit called WooRank, and it allows you to do a quick appraisal of how they think your website is performing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to flick out of my presentation and into a website. So this is a website which is a competitor to one of my clients. And here you can see it. Beautiful garden gloves and garden accessories. Really nice looking website. They've got beautiful photographs, really clear. They've got a quality offering. They've got a welcome. They've got stuff about their product range and a cute little um, quote at the bottom. What I'm going to do now is click the um, button that's going to hopefully appraise it using WooRank. And what this is going to do is it's going to take a look at how this website is performing based on what Google might be seeing when it comes to look at the website. As you can see, the little numbers are scrolling up on the screen. And just while it loads, um, I'm going to tell you that I know already that this website has got a couple of interesting challenges. Now, I'd like you to go and get this little button for yourself. As I said before, it's called WooRank, and if you go to your browser, it only works in the Chrome or Firefox browser. It's how to get extensions, which is on this little um, extra bar at the end, and you go down to um, more tools, and then you can get to extensions, and you search in there for WooRank, and you'll get your answers. Now, Omni Products is still loading, but let's start to take a look at the sort of checklist that they think you should be doing to improve your website, if this were your website. Firstly, it says there is a missing title tag. As there is, you must say what your website is. I can't guess from the name omniproducts.co.nz what this business sells. Ditto, there's no meta description, which is a longer word description, also explaining what your website is and does. Headings come in hierarchies from H1 through to H5 or 6. And as you can see, these are really imbalanced. They've got one H1 heading, which is the most important one, two H2s, one H3, four H4s. That doesn't seem to imply that they're in descending order of priority. This is the keywords cloud. This is what WooRank thinks the keywords are for this website. And it suggests that its keyword is not very consistently used. So it looks here at the frequency, whether it's in the title, whether it's in the description, whether it's in the header tags. Now, these keywords, products, omni range, gloves, and retail, are all in, in the header tags, but they're not in the title and description. Well, we know that because they were missing. It further goes and describes groupings of two keywords, which of course gives you a slightly better indication as to what the website's about. Articles, products, sustainability articles, products, contact, and admin login. Well, none of these are relevant to you, the public. 
you might look for sustainability articles, but why would that send you to a gloves website? You can see the disconnects. And here we have groups of three keywords that it's found. And again, they're really not lining up with what the business does. Alt attributes here are how pictures and images are described. A computer cannot read a picture, only a human can read a picture. And so what you have to do when uploading pictures to your website is to describe them so that they know what they are. So there are six images on this home page and three of them are missing or empty. This next one, the text to HTML ratio, tells me about how much words there are compared with code. And that's pretty low. It's not, although it's a visually beautiful website, it's not deemed to be good practice to have so little text compared with the other elements on the website. The site's got lots and lots of pages. That's quite possible because it does e-commerce and so there'll be an awful lot of products. They aren't registered with Google+. That's a slightly take it or leave it thing, but given that Google is the dominant search engine, particularly for New Zealand, USA, Australian businesses, it's probably worthwhile being on Google+. There are some nice internal links. None of them are broken. The IP resolves if you type in www in front of the URL or not type in those three Ws, it still sends you to the same address and the same website. That's quite important. And that's what IP canonicalization is also about. It's got a place for robots to go, which are the search engine's uh, little spiders, uh, to go and find out about the website. But there is no sitemap. Now, a sitemap is how these little robots go and index your website. It's a bit like having a family tree. It shows what the main pages are and which other pages are linked um, below the main pages. And so it allows Google or any other search engine to actually check that it has visited every page on your website and indexed them. Without a sitemap, you're cutting off one hand and tying it behind your back at the same time. A lot of the other features in this particular website are looking good. This is what the website looks like on a uh, handheld phone or a tablet screen. And it's mobile compatible, which is really important. Mobile speeds are slow, but unfortunately that seems to be pretty standard nowadays. It's very hard to get good mobile speeds. But you can see in summary that Wu thinks that you're about 55% of the way through the whole thing and that there's an awful lot that this firm could be improving about their website. Google, spiders, robots. The third reason why your website may not be performing the way you want is because you have to write a website for two audiences. One is human, the other is a machine. And I'm going to show you now how machine readers view what you and I would describe as plain English words and sentences. This URL, Open Calais, is a really handy tool that allows you to check how a machine reads the words that you've written. You go to this page and you paste in, in the white box on the right, a bit of text. And I've put in some text here that's from our own website. It's a heading. It says, I need more customers. If you haven't got regular marketing and sales planned, you're missing out on winning new customers. Proactive marketing activities and revenues will write a marketing execution plan with you and deliver it monthly. And on the left, you can see what this machine reader thinks these words are about. It thinks they're about business finance, sports, technology, and internet. And it then goes on and gives stars 
on the topics that it believes are relevant, such as entrepreneurship, marketing, business, sales, and technology internet. Those are all broadly correct. So one of the actions I'd like you to do after the talk is to make a note of viewer.opencalais.com and go and copy and paste the text from the home page of your website in there and go and see what it thinks your website is about and whether or not the machine agrees with you, the human reader. I'm going to show you another tool now, very much in the same vein. Sentiment analysis. As humans, we're really good at understanding emotion and nuance. We get jokes. We can understand sarcasm and humor. Machines are rather more challenged in most of these areas. And this is another free tool presented by alchemyapi.com which allows you not only to do a text appraisal like Open Calais that I just showed you, but also to look at what the sentiments are in your text. Again, I've put in some text from our own website which says, I need training. The latest marketing techniques are not yet in business books or being taught by universities and training firms. Get the advantage by being the first in your town or industry to implement a new method. You'll get a head start over the rest, and you'll make it harder for your competitors to catch up. And what you can see below is the blocks in green, purple, red, and gray. And on the left-hand side, I have clicked the sidebar menu, Key Words. And this is where it has pulled out the key words in this text and also assigned it to some sentiment. And so the green is positive sentiment, latest marketing methods, industry, help, new method, and advantage. The greys are neutral, and the reds they perceive as being negative. So on this appraisal, I possibly should be doing something about this red that says latest marketing techniques, because maybe that's not being viewed positively by machines as they're reading in our website. So does this make sense to you? Are you guys getting it? Nick's saying he thinks we have a technical glitch. Nick, are you back now? Can you guys let me know? I think we're all good okay. Good hey, that's we're good. good. Always a little nerve-wracking, isn't it, when uh, you think you might not be live. <laughs> right. So, what is the job that your website has to do? It's a tool. You're going to be using it for your marketing, sales, promotion. These, I suggest, are the four things that are the job of work that your website needs to do for your business. Number one, needs to get you found. Your business needs to be found by people who are inquiring and seeking out products and services. The second thing it needs to do is to help people quickly get to the answer that they're looking for. And that's really important because we're becoming more and more impatient and we like to get quick answers. Number three, of course, it has to then answer those questions. And number four, you want the website to shortcut your time to signing up a new client. So these all sound very nice and straightforward. But I'm going to suggest that this is the fourth reason why your website may be underperforming. The job of work of your website is not clear. I've put another example into the bottom of this slide, which again is from a client. They're an accounting firm. They sell a pretty standard range of accounting services. But not everybody wants to buy all of their different services. And so when we were considering how to lay out the page on their website, which is about their services, what I recommended was a very simple strategy, which is going to firstly answer question two, which is to shortcut the client search for answers, and then number three, answer the questions, and number four. 
get closer to signing up a new client. And here's how we did it. The green text are subheadings. Business services, business improvement, personal services. And so in, there were actually a few more lower down the page that I didn't include. In glancing through this web page, you, the reader, can quite quickly home in on the one or two areas that you perceive are relevant to you. We want a couple of sentences that help set out at a high level what they do. So personal services, many individuals need financial advice despite not being a business. We can help you with your personal tax returns or the preparation of your trust accounts with minimal fuss. Simple sentence, and if you're thinking, that's relevant to me, I'm getting it, you can then click the find out more here button. And that takes you through to the page where more answers are provided and there is an offer for the person visiting just to see whether or not they want to get in touch to find out more. And so I'd like you to take another task to do after the seminar, which is to go and look at the top four important pages on your website. You've probably got one that's about the firm, you've probably got one about your services or products, you've probably got a home page, and you might have another one or two. Look at those pages critically and tell me, do they shortcut your client search for answers? Are we talking features and benefits? Rather, are we talking benefits rather than features? Are you answering questions there? And is it blindingly obvious what you want the visitor to do next? Too many business websites are not blindingly obvious. You don't need to be patronizing in order to be blindingly obvious, but you and I can see on this sample page that if you want business improvement, you click here, it says find out more here. So it's telling the visitor exactly what you want her to do next. And that is a really, really good mantra to take into your appraisal of your own website. Here's another client website, real estate agent. How quickly can I get to my answer? You come to the home page, and this is the home page of a real estate agent's website. We sell apartments, it's all we do. Okay, well that's reasonably clear. If you haven't got an apartment, what happens? You go away. And that's good. We want people to go away who aren't interested in buying or selling apartments. He then drives you quickly to more information. Two red buttons, I'm buying, I'm selling. Guess what? Based on where you click, the business immediately knows what sort of message to give you. If you're buying, what do you think they're going to be doing? We're going to be talking about listings, we're going to be talking about how to filter your search, how to look in different areas, what the relative prices are. If you're selling, the message is going to be completely different. And for a business point of view, it makes it really, really easy to treat different customers differently. It's a real property at the same time. And in fact, we've got that covered too, because those people are generally investors. If you look at the top menu there, it says sell, buy, invest. And so in fact, investors is the third type of customer that this business is targeting. And again, there's a page for them where it's in investment language and it talks the answers to any questions that an investor might have. So let's look at you and your business. How can you be unique, special, stand out? If you've heard Tom's seminar, and I know you've, many of you will have heard it before, you know exactly what he teaches in terms of the uniqueness of your proposition, how to be tra transformational rather than traditional, how to be perceived as a specialist in a niche. These are all messages that you don't need to hear from me. If you want to look at it from a different point of view, Simon Sinek, very well-known public speaker, starts with the why of your business. Why are you in business? Then the what, then the how. He's done a lovely TED talk, it's about 18 minutes long and worth watching. Your special place as a business needs to be very clear 
and easy to explain. And this is what leads on to keywords, which of course is one of the catchphrases that web marketers talk about. So I'm now going to give you the fifth and final reason why your website is not performing the way you might want. And the answer is, the keywords are too broad and they're not aligned to customer needs. Unless you're extremely wealthy and a very large brand, it's rare that you can make a very broad keyword offering that will then find you enough traffic to bring you the right sort of customers in the right volume with the right ability to pay. And so that niche ability of making your messaging clear and unique is really, really important. So do go back to Tom's book, to his webinars, notes that you've probably had from previous events that you've attended, get your messaging right, and then let's use that to look further into keywords. Now, I'm gonna set you a little task. I want to know what you in your business are getting found for right now. The example I'm gonna show you is for an accounting firm. You may not be an accountant, doesn't matter. But if you'd like to go into a search engine and type in the name of your industry or your generic business service, and secondly, the name of your town. Now, those of us who are in big cities will be at a disadvantage uh, from people who are in smaller uh, uh, locations. But then have a look at the search results and give yourself some scores here. One point for every reference to your actual business on the first three pages, and there are 10 listings per page in Google. Give yourself another point if you're also included on business directories. I've suggested some different business directories here. Different countries have different directories um, that are used, and these are all really, really useful. If you've got a listing, these often show up ahead of your website because guess what, Localist and White Pages and Yale, they spend a lot of money getting their websites to show up when people type in search because they're trying to fight the Google, the Yahoo, the Bing. Now deduct a point if you are listed in any job seekers websites or any review websites like No Cowboys or Trade Me. Also, if there's the word fail associated with your brand name. These obviously are negatives and are not going to be encouraging people to come and look at your website. So just leap off and do that right now. If anybody's got, quickly open a browser. Let's see what you are getting found for. So type in your business trade. I use accountant, as you remember, as an example, and your town. And let's see if you care to share online on the questions. What are you getting found for? So Tom, if this was you, what would you want to get found for? I'm just struggling to unmute myself. It's not often that um, I'm forced to shut up, but uh, <laughs> I got myself unmuted. What would I want to be found for? Small business lead generation. How's that sound? But it's Sounds an great. Extraordinary, extraordinarily competitive uh, keyword phrase, I imagine. Absolutely. But what's interesting about you is actually you don't care to be a local business. You are an international business, aren't you? Correct, yeah. So for those of you who are local businesses, this is going to be particularly relevant. If you're international, like Tom, you've actually got a much bigger challenge coming up. So let's have a look at some of the actual answers that came out when I did a quick search for the words accountant and Manukau. Manukau is a suburb of the city that I live in. You're familiar with paid search and natural search. So on the image on the right, you can see there's a little yellow AD, which stands for advert, and that's an advertisement, and then there's a very light gray line below it. And then we've got natural search below that, and there's a list of different entities. 
Google very helpfully bolds the words that you have searched for. You can see here that some of these are have got the words accountant or accountants and Manukau in the heading, which is the purpley blue text, and some of them have got them in the uh, grey body copy. Now these align to what I was saying earlier about meta descriptions, that's the grey text, and header descriptions, which is the blue text. So the first one is Finder. Well, Finder is a directory listing for New Zealand, and this obviously suggests that if I go to their website, they'll list lots and lots of accountants in Manukau. The second one is Natural Chartered Accounting Firm, and lower down you've got uh, Slight Lala, another one, Localist is another directory, and down to um, Yellow Pages, and again then someone called Peter Harris. But Peter Harris, interestingly, if you look at the green URL there, is part of Yellow Pages. So he is benefiting from having paid Yellow Pages to get a listing there. And I would say that nowadays it's still worthwhile having yellow pages listings for your business because people like yellow spend a lot of time and money trying to get themselves to show up in search and you can benefit from that. So the sorts of tips that will get your website generating leads are when you can align the things that people type into Google search with what makes your website show up. So when you've done your little test you can then make a judgment as to whether or not in natural search your website shows up for the right search phrases and remember to check back to those machine tools Open Calais and Alchemy API because that will help you to write for the search algorithm as well as writing for people. Now. The next step, once your website is showing up in search for the right search terms, is to influence it. We've really got to make these things work for your business. And search engine optimization, or SEO, is one of the phrases that is used to describe a whole area of specialism in website marketing. Here are ways that you can improve and influence how your website shows up in search results. Number one, write using keywords and key phrases. When I showed you the appraisal earlier of the Gardening Gloves website, did you notice that the Woo Rank appraised keywords as individual words, as pairs, and in threes? And that's pretty normal. When people type searches into Google, what you find is they tend to use two or three words. It's reasonably rare if they write a whole sentence, and sometimes you write a single word, but again, that's quite rare. Use these on your home page. Use them on the descriptions of your services. Use them on your news blog. Now, landing pages, the second one on the list, is something I haven't discussed yet. But a landing page is a single page of your website which is dedicated to doing one thing. Those of you who remember Tom's teaching will know that direct response marketing is a catchphrase that he uses a lot, and it's a tool I use every single day. Direct response is when you write words, which in the lingo I would call copy, copywriting. You write copy that drives a response from the reader. It makes the reader do something. Remember back to that services page where I said click here to read more. Remember the website of the real estate agent that says I'm buying or I'm selling. If you're in neither of those modes, it's reasonably clear that you're not on a website that's likely to be helping you for whatever it is you want. If you're neither buying nor selling, what are you doing browsing the website of a real estate agent? And you can use this exact same principle of direct response and it works very well on landing pages. And landing pages are destination URLs designed to get the reader to do one thing and one thing only. I've got a particularly nice one on my website. If you want to go to creativeagencysecrets.com forward slash yellow, this is a landing page that I made to link from the yellow pages profile 
that I have for our business. We're listed under creative agencies because that's what we do. But I've chosen to make a landing page for people who come to our website from Yellow Pages. Why would I want to do something like that? Why not just send them to the home page? Well, I believe that people who go into Yellow Pages to find a supplier are in a particular mode. They are wanting something particular and they are wanting to get to answers fast. And so rather than push them through my home page and then from my home page out to two or three different options of different types of services, what I've chose to do is to make a single page that gives them a short guide to my website and where to find answers to what they might want. And just so that you know, it also helps me to track the visitors from Yellow. I know that I can tell from my Google Analytics how many incoming visitors I get from Yellow Pages, but by pushing them all to a single starting point, I can then treat them differently from people who've just come in from other types of search. And that's really helpful for me because I can tell whether or not they do anything after they visited that page. Do they go away again immediately, unsatisfied? Or which of the links on the page do they actually click on? And I'm going to show you another little tool here, which I absolutely love, which is this. So this is my website. And this is another little extension, which is called Google Page Analytics. Now, you need to be the business owner, and you need to have Google Analytics logged in. Is it annoying? doesn't seem to be working. But you click this extension, and it then shows you all the different um, live clicks that are going on on your website. So let's look at another. Oh, I don't know why it's not working. Sorry. When it's working, what you get is a little number next to each of the different menu items, and it shows you what percentage of clicks come through to each of those different links. Oh, here we go, and it's working now. So you see these little orange buttons? This tells me that real time, this is a UK client, so UK is asleep right now. Um, there are four visitors right now on the website, and 56% of people click on this bit in the top menu, which is the sales and support and the logo and the home page. Those are all the same links. 9.9 .9 go to the shop, 3.7 go to news, 1.6 go to their podcast, and so on. It also shows that a very large number click here. This is search inside the website. So 1,834 people have clicked here. And that's brilliant because it tells me exactly how effective each of these elements are on the website in getting my customers to do what I want them to do, which is the direct response thing. Now, influencing your SEO. The second thing we can do is to use outbound marketing to send people back to those pages. Now, nearly every business nowadays has a newsletter. May, nearly every business nowadays writes articles, which they might be published in print magazines, they might be on online magazines, they might be published via your um, LinkedIn page, all sorts of different ways. Use these different tools to send people back to your website. You control your website, it should be the hub of your entire marketing activity, and Examples of these are advertising, my Yellow Pages advert, is sending people back to my website. Direct mail, you all responded to uh, an offer by Tom to come to this webinar, it's direct mail. You have self-identified as being of interest in the topic that I'm talking about, fabulous, thank you for sticking with us. And if Tom had so chosen, he could have sent you back to his website, in fact, and sent you to the registration page for the GoToWebinar, but the point is the same. You chose to click on a hyperlink in an email you received. 
and then lastly here we are webinars and seminars and I'm going to show you some hyperlinks and I'm going to show you some of my little tricks of the trade later on as to how I'm going to send you to my website as a result of being here today now the flip side inbound marketing these are great ways of building your profile answering people's questions and making your brand and products and services relevant to people who may at some point be in the market for buying they're not very good at getting leads but they're quite good at getting people to come and visit your website social media is a massive category Blogging is another category. Blogging is quite an interesting tool because although you may write it on your website or you may record it as a podcast or a, an audio video podcast like Tom's Bomb, you can then get that shared through other media that you don't control. The key is to ensure that there is always the means for the person who's watching or listening or reading to come back to your website. The biggest waste of time ever is creating a viral piece of content that doesn't tell you who wrote it or how to get in touch with them. SEO, of course, also brings inbound traffic to your website, as do ebooks and white papers. And if you're in the business to business uh, world, there are some extremely good curated websites like businesstocommunity.com, which is biz B number two community where they will republish your blog posts to a much much wider audience than you or I are capable of building on our own so really good to find distributed media that have the capability to bring incoming visitors secondly obviously once they come back to your website your hope is to find a way to engage with them to get their permission to share their email address with you and their permission then to have ongoing dialogue and that's part of your skill as a marketing communicator now this is the hard message that you possibly don't want to hear but this is what I'm particularly skilled at doing getting found for the right things takes time persistence and diligence if you don't have the time yourself to invest in the regularity of ongoing work to do this sort of marketing you've got a challenge and your challenge is very straightforward are you going to hire in order to do it in-house with one of your colleagues or are you going to outsource like Tom does to his wonderful assistant Olivia to get it done by somebody else remember you can actually make quite quick changes to search results if you're prepared to spend money on adverts on Google AdWords and paid search but remember that is temporary you stop paying it all goes away if your website is not yet getting found for the right things the tactic I recommend to you is this fix some of the things we've already talked about and then use paid advertising to start to drive traffic to your website and over time taper that off and migrate to a tactic of promoting natural search results which is what we've been talking about with the inbound and outbound marketing and the keywords and key phrases on the previous slide so what we're talking about here is trying to show you how to join up your website with your marketing activities everyone talks about things being seamless it's remarkably difficult to do seamless marketing mainly because with the proliferation of different channels and different people searching for different things it's very hard to say this is the single sequence of events that will lead me to a paying client however you can use a range of different tools and a range of different um, tactics to ensure that people recognize your website when they get there they hopefully realize if they've been there before and you then use your direct response skills to persuade them once they have got to your website however they wherever they started you want them to get to your website and then use those direct response copywriting skills to persuade the customer to put up her hand and say this is who I am and yes I would like to have a dialogue with you the business 
And that's the point at which I feel that the marketer's job is done and the business uh, specialists can then take over and continue the discussion. Now, I want to show you a way about how people actually use the internet. And it's so diverse that I may or may not surprise you, but when I first did this, believe me, it really surprised me. Social media is viewed as either one or two things. Is it overhyped, full of teenagers talking rubbish, or is it the most exciting free marketing tool for your business? Well, whatever your view is, I know that I like social for certain things and I loathe it for other things. Just a quick poll in the questions. Tell me if you've ever had a, um, a social media frustration, if you can tell me quickly what it is, and then we'll take a quick look at what the sorts of things are that you have found frustrating. While you're doing that, I'm going to remind you of Tom's message that social is not a lead generation tool. It's a very good nurturing tool, it's a very good profile building, brand building tool, but it's reasonably unlikely, not impossible, but reasonably unlikely that people will buy just after having seen something you've written on social media. It is possible and it can be done, but it tends to be after they have already met your brand, interacted with your brand and are familiar with your product and service. Bruce can't get his head around Twitter. Yes, um, that's an interesting point of view, Bruce. It is a curious place. I'm going to show you something that I hope will help clarify for you. All social media, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, works on the same principle of sharing information but using overlapping circles of influence. Now, Tom kindly explained when we started that he and I met through a mutual acquaintance. We each used his principle of reciprocity to get to know each other. I started by buying his book. He checked that I did mean to buy 10 and not one. He then checked out my website. He then invited me to be on his five-minute time bomb. I agreed to do that. And we've quietly escalated our relationship. And you are here thanks to Tom, because you're in his network. And now I'm hoping that some of you will get into my network. So let's have a look at how that works. And this is one of the principal differences with how people do business in Australia and New Zealand compared with my experience of coming from the UK and working in the USA. Here's a representation of some of the people that I know. And here's another representation of the people that you know. This could easily be Tom and me. And now you guys, who know Tom first, but are now getting to know me, are here, sitting in the middle. Now, you know that Tom says many stage-wise and insightful things. And every now and then, I suspect you'll think, that's great, I'm going to tell it to someone else. And in the good old days, you just would have perhaps vo ver verbalized it, vocalized it to somebody. Using social media, we can then do this. If I share something that Tom has written or said or recorded online, the people that I know and the people that he knows might see it twice. But the people that I know that Tom doesn't know and then the people that they know that I don't know, which is that big navy blue circle, gives the potential to reach a very, very large audience. Now, Bruce, Twitter tends to get used, I find, for sharing experiences and expertise. So in the same way that LinkedIn people share articles, on Twitter, I find the people I follow, and I will caveat that this is my following, which may be very different from yours, they are people who are available to help, to ask and answer questions, and possibly to have discussions. Let's have a look at this example. This is for real. When I first gave this talk, 
I did this experiment. At 2.10 in the afternoon, I typed into Twitter, and this is my uh, Twitter profile, where can I find a good accountant? Okay? So, simple question. By the time I took that screen grab, it had been online for four minutes. By the time I went home, here were two of several answers. I got a Twitter reply immediately from someone whose handle is Orzors, who recommends Roy Shepherd. Now, you all know I'm a rower. Orzors is someone who's also a rower, and he says he's an ex-rower. What value does that give to me? It tells me instantly that Roy is a trusted friend, possibly even an accountant to Mr. Orzors. But it also tells me that he and I have a point of common interest above and beyond my need to find an accountant. And I know that if I were to go and get in touch with Shepherd Accounting, we'd be able to obviously, hey, we both know the same guy, but we could also talk row. Now my Twitter automatically goes into my LinkedIn. And I got an answer through LinkedIn from a completely different person who recommended Simon Manawati. He's awesome, he says. What a great recommendation. And do you notice how Simon's name is in yellow and underlined? That tells me it's a hyperlink. And I'm in LinkedIn, and I can click on that, and I can go straight to Simon's profile and see him and check him out. Interestingly, it also alerts Simon to the fact that Francois, our mutual friend, has mentioned him. And so Simon has the opportunity to come back to me direct and say, hey, Francois said you might be looking for a good accountant. How good is that? And just in these two reasonably simple answers, examples, you can see that my network of with people that I don't already know. Like I can trust it. For a hey Rebecca, for some reason we've lost your sound. Uh, it looks like you're just clicking offline and online. So just check if you would, uh, Skype's exited, Dropbox has exited, if you've got any other programs that are using up just a little bandwidth, or if someone else in the office is like uploading a video or something, you might want to just take a minute if you can hear me to check on that just to prep a bit of bandwidth because none of us can hear you right now. But um, folks, just if you do want to hang around, please, make sure Rebecca gets the message so we can uh, ensure that the rest of the presentation is, is completed. Uh, Rebecca, just let me know if you can hear me. No, not you, Michael. <laughs> and everyone else who's got questions, is it me? Is it, no, it's not you. It's not you, Mike. It's me. That's the breakup line, right? Okay. Yeah, Chris, you'll be able to hear me, but Rebecca's just... The control panel here is just showing me Rebecca's got a bit of a bandwidth issue. Um, so you guys give us give us just about 60 seconds, maybe 120 seconds, because I'm just going to call Rebecca on a mobile and see if I can get a pick up, because it's a, ba it's a bandwidth, definitely a bandwidth issue. And given that it wasn't an issue for the first 40 minutes, it's pretty likely someone else is hogging the bandwidth. 
But look, any questions at the moment, type them on in. Uh, now, the benefit to the firm is that, hey, first Rebecca, of all, hey. Hey, we've got a bandwidth issue. Um, yeah, you were offline for like the last four or five minutes. So it could be okay. that someone else in the office has been uploading a video or something. Um, but hey, you're back, so let's just cross fingers. So we, we've lost the last three or four minutes, sorry. Okay, so let's recap back to the uh, beginning of the anecdote about the accountant. I'm guessing you didn't hear that. Well, we got, we got to the ors, ors, and the fact there was commonality. And that's Good. after that, after that we lost you. Perfect. So what followed was questions. Questions are a great way to get web traffic and then to start discussions. And if you can answer people's questions, it's a fabulous way to showcase your expertise. My client, the accountant, wrote an article on their blog called What Business Expenses Can I Claim? It was a relatively straightforward, short article. And after a while, I noticed it was getting a lot of website visitors because people type that into search. And so I encouraged them to write subsequent articles. Any examples of different business expenses that can be claimed. So for example, tradesmen can claim back business expenses, GST, on things like work clothing because they need them for safety reasons. Whereas people like me who sit behind a desk cannot claim my spectacles as a business expense because they're not required for my job. Every time the IRD changes the rules about business expenses, they write another article. And guess what? Every time they write another article, they link back to the first one. And they also link from the first one out to the subsequent articles. So if you've done a search and said, what business expenses can I claim? You come to their website and you find a short article. And then it says, here are other articles that might interest you, all on similar topics. And as a result, we've got quite a body of work of articles all about the same broad area. So there was a fourth thing that I got them to do, which was to collate all of their separate articles together into an ebook. The ebook's called What Business Expenses Can I Claim? And guess what? There's now a landing page where you can go and get that ebook. And what does this mean from the business? Because when you first search for what business expenses can I claim, you might end up on their website having no idea who they are, and you might go away again. But if you click through to a second or a third article in order to get closer to the answer to your specific question, and bear in mind they also offer the opportunity for you to ask them a question if they have a specific um, point which isn't covered by the article, the visitor gets closer and closer to revealing their identity to the business. And that ebook is the end point, because in order to get the ebook, they have to put their email address in. The business won't spam them, but it does then know who they are and the fact that at that point in time, they were interested in knowing what business expenses they can claim. And if their question, of course, is not answered by the ebook, and there's the opportunity to start a dialogue, and a dialogue that might lead to new business. Now I want to do another little side trip, because at the end of this webinar, I'm going to make you a little offer of an ebook. But I want to show you how I've got it set up, and what it means to me as the business owner. I'm going to send you to this web page. It's called Get My Website Working For Me. What I've got is an ebook, which is a collation of articles that explain five different tips and how to execute them on your website that will help you improve your website. So I hope it'll be useful. I've made a unique URL. Can you see the
working for me. A bit of introductory proof. We wrote an ebook for you. It explains what it's going to teach you. And then it asks you to make a commitment. Oops, now you can tell I'm supposed to be at my yoga class. Here's the commitment. Will you commit to reading this ebook? Fix a time in your diary now. And this is really important because by making the commitment, you have put aside the 15 or 20 minutes it'll take you to read this book and to work out whether the tips it gives are ones that are relevant to you and worth executing. Here's the sign up form. Yes, I want the ebook, it says. Well, that's quite nice. We ask for an email address. That's the only required field. That's what the red star means. But we also ask you your name, your organization, which country you're from. And this is interesting. Do you have a question for us? So in the example of the ebook about the business expenses, it's just possible that someone has come to the website with a burning question that they think won't be covered by the ebook. And so this gives an opportunity for that visitor to have a dialogue immediately with the business owner. Now, when you fill this out, you end up being serviced by this, which is an autoresponder called Get Your Website Working For You. And here's what's going to happen. Immediately, I'm going to send you the hyperlink that tells you how to get your book. Okay? If we track back from that, we then try to follow up on the commitment that you made to execute the tips. And so keywords, technical changes, understanding analytics, testing your title tags. All of these would take time for you to do. And so there's a delay of up to 11 days here from when you sign up that will help coach you through making the changes that you need and also demonstrating some of the benefits that will come to you and your website after you've made that change. And of course it ends by asking whether or not you succeeded. And that's one way to show how to start a discussion with a prospective client who may have a unique question and who does want to get their website working and they do want to learn how to drive a website. So the last bit I want to run through with you is measurement and analysis. And I am a closet geek and I do love this stuff. So what you've got here is some screen grabs out of Google Analytics. Google Analytics is free to install Put it on your website today if you do not have it already. Make that your number one priority because it is a really useful way of finding out what is happening with your website. Let's look at this graph I've put on the top of the page. It bobbles along up and down and up and down through August and September and then suddenly has a spike, which is a little unusual. I'll tell you that the low point, this is a business website, so the low points are weekends. And business websites generally don't get much traffic at the weekend because people are not in business mode. But you can see that they were probably getting 20, 15 visitors a day, sometimes close to sort of 20, 25. And then suddenly this spike shoots right up to 60. That was a newsletter. They sent out a newsletter, and in the newsletter were hyperlinks back to the website. How powerful is that? Once a month. A little message out, drives website visitors, and it reminds people that you're there. And many, many businesses benefit from that because a lot of the recipients don't delete the newsletters. They keep them and find them in their inbox when they want to get in touch with the business in the future. They also find that they get inbound inquiries from the newsletter. They hit reply and they write something that has got no connection whatsoever to the content of the newsletter. They're just using it as a tool to get back in touch with the business. I've been meaning to get in touch with you, Rebecca, says somebody. So you can easily be benefiting from your existing database of getting in touch with them and staying in touch with them on a regular basis.
So you can see another little bit of Google that shows a pie chart of new versus returning visitors, which is quite nice, and then the number of users who came and the number of page views. This is really important. On a website, you don't want people to only look at one page and then go away. Your goal is to have something on every page that leads a visitor closer to putting up their hand and saying, hello, this is me and I'd like to speak to you, the business. Now, this website has an average of 2.65 pages per session viewed by a visitor. Even so, if you look on that second line at the right-hand end, it says bounce rate, 59.14%. Now, a bounce rate is the number, the percentage of visitors who only look at a single page. That's not a great number. I'm working with this client to reduce that significantly because when someone only comes once and then goes away again, you probably have not achieved your goal of getting them closer to starting a dialogue or you have pers persuaded them that you are not right for them and they've gone away. But what if we overlay those new visitors and those returning visitors onto that bounce rate? What if we split up that 59% and say of that 59%, how many of them are new visitors? Because they're the ones that we actually care about because they're new to us and I need to know whether or not we're successfully turning away the wrong sort of customers, that's what you want to do, or whether we're failing to engage the right sort of customers. Second point, if you are a returning visitor and you came to the website because of the newsletter, I already know you, I've already got permission to keep in touch with you through our newsletter, I know your email address, I quite possibly know other things about you in my database. Does it matter so much if my returning visitors only look at one page? I'll leave you to ponder that one. Having introduced measurement and analysis, it becomes a discipline that you have to add into your monthly calendar. And I recommend that people build a spreadsheet and just keep track of these simple numbers. They're all very easy to find on Google Analytics and if you don't know how to, please ask. What are the total numbers that you're getting? What's the peak day number? How many pages are people coming to look at? I've already talked about the bounce rate, the new visitor percentage. Where are people coming from immediately before they come to your website? Where is the hyperlink? Are they coming from Google? Are they coming from a search engine? Or have they come from the 8020 Center or an email from Tom Poland? What other sites are referring you? Could you form reciprocal relationships with them? Could you build them into your marketing to benefit both of you? Remember those overlapping circles of influence that I used to illustrate social media? That also works in business networks. What keywords are people using? What's the most popular, the second or the third? Which pages are viewed the most? How many people use your contact form or your get in touch page? And how many people are actively subscribed into your newsletter or other outbound marketing? All of these will tell you whether or not you're growing your audience, you're engaging with your audience, and then you're provoking your audience and pushing them closer to dialogue with the business. And that, quite simply, is the goal of your website. If your website is performing, it should be drawing visitors in, it should be persuading them to lift up their hands and to identify themselves, and it then should be pushing them towards starting a dialogue with the business. And that is all your website needs to be able to do. And now for the offer. Here's the URL again, and I will share these slides with you after today. Get my website working for me, and this is what the ebook is going to show you. It's going to show you how to find out that your site is performing. Some of them are tips that you've already seen, but there's a couple of other good ones, particularly one to find out how, whether your website works well on mobile devices that I'd like you all to test after today. How to improve the way you show up in Google. If you remember when you search in Google and what often
business name. You get the name of the business and then you have links to six separate individual pages within their website and a map showing uh, where their office location is. I'm going to show you how to influence which pages are displayed there and how they are described. The Google Analytics keyword workaround is absolutely critical. In the bad old days, actually it was the good old days, Google Analytics used to show you what people searched for that led them to your website. They don't do that anymore because Google wants you to pay for that information using AdWords and other paid for advertising. And so along with some other smart people on the internet, we've found a workaround that will give you a good indication as to the keywords that people are searching for and which ones are drawing traffic to your website. That was the source material that was the very early slide that I showed you about what those two different businesses were about and the keywords that they were showing up for. And then the last two, title tags and meta descriptions. I told you they were important. I showed you one website where they were not present. This explains how to write them and where to put them into your website and how to get them right. And it explains exactly how to do each of these five things. The only thing it doesn't show you how to do is what the back end functionality of your website looks like because there are lots of different um, content management systems that you can use and so we don't uh, show that because I could be just telling you how to do it completely wrong. But that's where your web developer will be able to help you if that doesn't answer the questions. So lastly, as we move into questions, please connect with me. I do like to know some of the people that have taken time out of their busy days to listen to what I have to say. If you're on LinkedIn, please find me. I'm the only person in the world called Rebecca Caro. I'm on Twitter. I'm reasonably easy to find. And please tell me when you invite me to connect that you met me through Tom and the 8020 Centre. Hey, now, Rebecca, thanks. Any questions? Uh, yeah, well, I just want to, I just want to, um, I just want to let everyone know that we don't do any affiliate commission swaps. There's no commission. I've introduced Rebecca to you for one reason and one reason only. I regard her as literally one of the two best marketing web developers in the world. And there's lots of people who do fancy graphics and make things look slick. But what uh, Rebecca's kind of a secret source, as I'd call it, the essence of what makes her very special. Uh, and the other person's in Germany and charges an outrageous fortune, by the way. Uh, so mm -hmm. so um, the thing that makes her incredibly special is what I mentioned at the start of this. Is you, you don't only get a leading edge, uh, graphically sensational website, but you get a, a website that generates leads uh, for a whole lot of reasons, not least of which is the way she lays the websites out and all the stuff she does behind the scenes of the website, some of which she shared with us today. Uh, so if you if you want to make the most of generating leads from the real estate space, which is your website, have a chat with, with Rebecca. She's, she's like me. There's not going to be any hard sell or anything. If there's a fit, there's a fit. If the price is right, it's right. If it's not, it's not. But um, I would seriously encourage you to get a hold of Rebecca. Uh, in fact, Rebecca, I have been chasing you for the last five days because I've got a new business I'm just investing in, and um, okay. we need you to do the website. So, so, we do. so put me at the front of the queue, okay? <laughs> you're, you're my number one, Tom. Cool. But um, not until I've answered Paul Gilhooley's question. Yeah, let's go. Um, Paul, how your, important is it to get your ebook professionally produced compared with DIY? I will tell you, the perception of professionalism is really, really, really important. It's up there with having a good looking logo, a good looking photograph for yourself on all of your professional profiles. But I will tell you how to shortcut that. What you do is you go on to one of the freelance websites like guru.com, Upwork, um, don't go to Fiverr because it's too cheap and you won't get good value. Go to um, 99 Designs and pay for a ebook template. What you will be buying is a front cover, a back cover, and a um, inside page layout of your ebook template, which you can then use and reuse over and over again. 
I'm going to show you how we did this for this. What we got was a design put into PowerPoint. Now, nearly everybody can use PowerPoint. And so the design that we had made is now the ebook. For this is a, a client of ours who has um, a lot of advice that they sell in ebook format. So we said the brief was that we needed a single image that we could use over and over again. Here's a good example. These two are by the same author, which is why they're red. This one's by a different author, which is why it's blue. And you open it up, and it's got the logo, it's got the title, it's got a very obvious silhouette, and you can then, um, it allows you to take a little bit of a detailed look. It's got the author's name at the bottom. By paying a little bit of money, Paul, to get a template that you can then recycle, we change the background cover, color, and that's just a really simple way of making them all look different, but they all have a common branding. So I hope, does that answer your question? You don't need to pay to have every single ebook separately produced, but I do recommend you get a good template made up. Yeah, and uh, just a place you can go, 99designs is, is excellent, but it's become very expensive. So you mm. can go to one of the websites that um, Rebecca referred to, elance.com, elance.com, or odesk.com, they're now called Upwork, but go to one of those, and for about, I'd say about $100, you can get this thing producerly designed, sorry, professionally designed, and a 3D image that you can display on your website, which looks really, really cool. Mm. So. Um, yeah, 500 bucks for a six-page book. Forget it, Paul. Go to elance.com, post a project, upload the uh, the mock-up, and people will come back to you with samples of their work, and you can pick the one that works for you best. But I wouldn't think you'd need to pay any more than $100 to have that done. Okay. Um, now, Roberta's, uh, Rebecca, she's asking for the link to access. So we put that into the chat, so that's the creativeagencysecrets.com forward slash get hyphen my hyphen website hyphen etc. Look out for the chat. Uh, window because I have posted in there. I see that takes care of that question. Uh, Rebecca, Chris is asking, really love Facebook for promoting my work. I didn't appreciate an abusive comment made on a vendor page that couldn't be removed. So abusive comments are sadly a fact of life. and it t They tend to be written by people who have got emotional and mental problems. That doesn't excuse <laughs> them. It doesn't make them go away either. It, I generally do not recommend the removal of um, negative comments. Let's be clear. If it is abusive and if it was on an event website, you should go to the event organizer and ask them to remove it, or you should go to the software owner and get them to remove it, because um, abuse is inappropriate anywhere. I know I swore earlier, but let's be completely clear. That is not right. However, negative comments are a fact of life and in my experience leaving a negative comment up but responding to it is the important and responsible thing for a brand owner to do. The reason being that you need to acknowledge that there are detractors out there and there are people who are not right for you, your business. And so you can diffuse their negativity by saying Thank you for your remarks. I happen to disagree with you professionally, but let's agree to disagree on this occasion. And just try and take the heat out of it. If they insist on coming back and wanting to kind of fight it out, my recommendation is to say, could we take this discussion offline? You know, would you be kind enough to email me? You know, and then I can answer your specific inquiry, you know, because it's not appropriate to do these things. You know, in front of other people. And so that's what I would recommend. I would say it's very unfortunate if the event organizer couldn't remove an abusive comment. Um, but the other thing that tends to happen if you have an engaged community is that other people will tend to leap to your defense. And what will happen is that in the comments you will read a whole string of them and you'll find that on balance you can form your own view whether you've got involved in the argument or not. There will be people who will say, that's utter rubbish. My experience was completely different. And it was this. 
and then there may be others who agree with the abuser. But if you are a high quality business, you're transparent, you try to trade as honestly as you can, and you have got satisfied clients, there's nothing wrong in quietly offline asking your satisfied clients if they'd be kind enough to go over there and leave a positive comment to try and diffuse the anger. Does that answer your question? Pretty sure it would. Um, and you, you can actually remove comments on, if it's your Facebook page, you can certainly remove the comments, but um, yeah, if it's abusive and uh, if this and so on, definitely get rid of it. But I, 100% Rebecca, yeah, you'll have um, you have the community leaving your defense and basically if a person's a dickhead, well, you know, you probably can't help them, but uh, <laughs> so leave it there and they'll let, let their dickheadedness shine for all to see. Um, cool, so a big thank you from a lot of different people. Uh, Michael Rebecca, Boss. Yeah, Michael's asking, Michael. look, I was told not to put any more than email and first name when asking people to opt into your offer because that will put more people off. Is that correct. Michael, there are many points of view on this. When I put my offer in, the actual only requirement I put in is your email address, but there are advantages to sharing more information, and some people are happy to share and some are not. And so I tend to err on the side of caution. I make it clear, you see the form that I've got here, is that I would like to know your first name, last name, your organization, country, and whether you've got a question for us but I don't require you to fill it in. Yes, if I know your first name, I can personalize my communications with you, but fundamentally, we are new in our relationship, and so I try not to be too demanding. I use the principle of reciprocity. I am offering you something. You say, yes, I would like it. I then do my best to get it to you as quickly and painlessly as possible. And so I use that as my view when considering what fields are required and what are not. Some people may well be put off, but if your offer is good enough, I think they will push past the fact that you've asked them to give them three bits of information, name, surname, and organization as well, and still want to get the offer. At the end of the day, remember, one of the jobs of your website is to filter out people who you don't want to work with, as well as filter in those that you do. And you might find that uh, there's a particular client profile that is very aligned to your ideal client, and they are prepared to fill in more fields than another type. So my only answer to you really is to go and experiment, and you will learn for your market and your business by experimentation what works well and what works not so well. And you, you can check that on your analytics by the number of people who leave your website off that sign up page, come to the page and then decide not to sign up. Cool. And we better start wrap, wrapping it up, I think. Uh, but just a two last questions, a real quick one, I think. Roberta's asking, how long does it take to get the ebook? I confirm my email, and, or the book, sorry, I confirm my email, nothing happened. Okay, I will check it out. Um, I will. Sorry, it should go through immediately, but I will I will check it out check and it out. All try right. see if I can and resolve it. Sorry. So, so last, last question, lots of thank yous coming through. Thanks for everyone for the thanks. Uh, Adam's got the same same question. So we'll, Rebecca will sort that out. Last question from Paul. I, I put a new blog article on my website each week. What are the ways to get it read more widely? So Paul, um, I'm assuming you're in a business. Um, one way is to go to somewhere like Business Community, which is a syndication service, and find a um, create an account there and see if they will syndicate it. When you, I'm assuming you're also on LinkedIn, why don't you also copy and paste the exact same article onto your LinkedIn profile, where you can um, let me just uh, show you. You can actually um, put it in there and um, get it profiled and viewed, and then it'll go into the timeline for your people your connections are on LinkedIn. Um, another way is to find a non-competing business. So this is the bit here where it says publish a post, where you can put your own articles onto LinkedIn. A third thing is to find a business that's um, complementary to yours and do a deal with them that you will um, reshare their articles on your LinkedIn if they do the same to you. So you widen your circle of influence. The fourth thing is, have you got a newsletter? 
and if you have got a newsletter, put your blog article into your newsletter as well. And that fulfills one of my key mantras, which is write once, use three times. So if you can use, reuse that same article, brilliant. Does that help? I'm sure it helps a lot. It's, uh, that's, uh, that's an incredibly succinct and yet fulsome response. So I'm pretty sure that, that Paul's got a lot of value from that. Thank you. Well, I think we'll wrap up, folks. Wrap up, folks. And thanks again, Rebecca, for rocking up and sharing. We've got so many people have come through saying thanks. It's been terrific content, really insightful. Uh, so, folks, you do. I'll put, I'll put the link into the chat. Uh, can you just put that? Can you click on that uh, tab again with the contact one that we've offered? Get my website is, yeah, working. Yeah, get, get my website working for me. So, folks, if you click on the screen, that's not going to take you there. So, go and have a look at the chat, or just take a note of it: creativeagencysecrets.com forward slash get hyphen my hyphen. Well, you can read the rest. We'll leave that up on the screen for a few minutes. Uh, I've got more people saying thanks, Shane. Fabulous content, thank you. Um, yeah, cool. Um, so we're going to shut the shut the webinar down. Uh, Rebecca, if you could stay on the line, I'd, wanna, I'd love to have a quick chat. But thanks so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, book a chat with Rebecca and get your website rock and rolling. Cheers, everyone.